Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. You know, I simply cannot stress enough how important it is to celebrate life every damn chance we get. And with if you're within the sound of my voice, that must mean you are in the seats with once more. As always, my name is Dave Voigt, and I'm the host of this podcast, where we sit down with a wide-ranging variety of industry professionals and pick their brain about current projects, state of the industry, how they got started, and so very much more in a light and conversational fashion. And if you like how we do things around here, I'm assuming you do, you're listening to the podcast right now, uh, you can find us uh, basically wherever you get your podcasts. Apple, Spotify, Amazon, Google, it's all good. And plus, we archive every single one of our episodes over at our In The Seats YouTube channel, so if you can give us a like and subscribe there as well, that'd be great. Also, you can find us on the social media for all sorts of fun updates, either at In The Seats or at It's Podcast One on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And as a bonus, we're on the TikTok at In The Seats, just for some fun. But what the hell? What is life? Life is not worth living if you can't have a little bit of fun once in a while, right? And uh, finally, and this is something we have fun doing, uh, visit us over at In The Seats, intheseats.ca for all the latest and greatest from the world of entertainment, film, television, the moving image in general, because that's what we love to talk about and write about. And we love it when you come by and read about it. So please come on by. On this episode, oh boy, we've got one of those films that really makes it, uh, makes you take perspective and really sort of allows you to appreciate life in general. It is a, it is a film called A Space in Time, and it is a, it's a candid portrait about uh, a family struggle to turn uh, a, uh, a disease called Duchenne muscular dis- dystrophy, which is pretty rare, but it's, it, has, it has fatal consequences. And it's one of those things that on the surface you would think this is horrible and this is heavy. And I mean, obviously there is no cure, so it is horrible and it is heavy, but this film doesn't try to focus on that. It tries to focus on... Uh, the quality of life of not just the kids and the people who have this condition, but of the caregivers as well, and just trying to paint a portrait of, you know, taking some of the positivity in life and trying to find sort of the quality, like the, the positive qualities in life where they're not always easy to find. And it's it's really one of those things where you just have to think about it and it's important to think about it and we had the distinct pleasure of talking with director uh nick tossig about the film and just sort of the process therein and and giving what on the surface could be a really depressing and kind of heavy-hitting story which you know a lot of other documentaries are guilty of when dealing with sort of terminal and life-threatening illnesses and trying to give it a little bit of a, I don't want to say positive spin because that's the wrong word, but maybe life-affirming because, you know, life is a gift and it's one that you've got to sort of appreciate when you're in the moment of it. And just because you have a sort of terminal disease doesn't mean you don't want to live life to the fullest. And I think this film really shows that in a beautiful way and it's on digital and VOD platforms now, so I do recommend you check it out. Uh, but more importantly, I hope you enjoy our talk with Nick because I think it's a good one. Now, I mean, obviously, I guess just to, to to kick it off, congratulations on the film. And I mean, yeah. I guess my first question is, can you walk me through, I guess, I mean, obviously it's a personal story, so the inspiration is there. But walk me through, I guess, sort of wanting to document it and wanting to sort of give us the document of quality of life rather than ravages of the disease kind of thing. Yeah, look, I think, I suppose... Because I because I work in the business anyway. I um I was very aware I used to work in distribution before I worked in production. I was very aware that films like this around disability are, are super hard to get out there. There are so many obstacles to getting them out there and in one sense, unless you have, you know, an A-list star or something, you 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 struggle to get audiences. And even broadcasters are wary of this type of programming because it tends to be a bit too um it tends to be often it just there tends to be a little bit too much misery, I think, for audiences, which I, I get and understand. So I think the idea here was was to turn that notion on its head and try and make something quite transcendent. So we deliberately went, okay, there are too many 
kind of victim pity narratives around disability. So let's just forget all of that and try and make something which actually almost surprises surprises viewers and audiences, you know, because actually it becomes something quite transcendental. You know, that's that's what that's what we try to do. Now from a storyteller standpoint, I mean I guess my next question is how did you sort of manage to I guess find the through line for the story? Because I mean I can imagine there were days where you didn't necessarily you know, would want to have sort of the happier side of things or sort of focus on more of the positives, but really just like, how do you find sort of the story in the line? Because I can imagine it's hard. Like, I mean, there'd be good days, there'd be bad days when dealing with a, with a, with a condition like this. Yeah. I mean, look, it's, I think, I think for, um, I think in a way, I think for Clara and I, you know, we, we, it's something about, it's something about trying, trying to, trying to find art as a way to kind of make sense of it all so the truth is is that we could never we can never kind of script this because it's yeah. not a full narrative that we don't have much control over but i think it was almost us trying to make sense of it for ourselves as much as for audiences so i think that you know hopefully what the film does is it shows us going through a process as well where we go from, you go from a, you get you know you go from a process as a parent of it's a bit like grief, actually, stages of grief, and you kind of go from, you know, anger to denial to, you know, to um, acceptance. And, and you're, you're, but at the same time, you're, you're moving between all those <laughs> conflicting feelings and emotions all the time. But I, but it, it's also the fact that you don't, you do get to that point where you have to be, you kind of think like, you know, we can either respond to this, uh, you know, we can either respond to this negatively or positively. You know, there's a point where you can almost make a choice. <laughs> and even though there are days where you want to respond to it negatively and shout and scream and think, I can't handle this. Uh, thankfully, you know, the positives tend to outweigh the negatives. <laughs> so that's basically how it happened, you know. Well, I mean, and that's, yeah. a fan- that's, a, that's a fantastic way to look at it because, I mean, and I think, like you said, when dealing with issues like this, there aren't the films that are out there tend like you say tend to be a bit of a tend to be a downer they tend to be tend to bring a lot of misery and i mean but at the same time you know we can't assume that anybody who is afflicted with this condition his life is 100 percent misery how important was it for you to sort of put out there just like you say maybe that roller coaster of emotion because there's going to be ups and downs rather than just sort of this is bad and we have to deal with it kind of thing i mean it's it's, it's interesting this whole thing about this whole notion about disability because in the world where we live in now that so there's a guy in the film who's the older guy with duchenne who's he's extraordinary I mean, he's 39 years old now so most people with duchenne die around 25 in mid-20s He's, he's, he's amazing, John. And it's interesting with John because John was, we wanted him because he was adamant about the fact that, you know, his serious disability is just one part of him. And, you know, and so what he represents is the fact that, of course, like, like, like all of us, you know, we, 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 we form an instant impression of somebody, particularly when they're like John, where they're basically locked in. I mean, he's fully paralyzed. He can move his hand to operate his chair and he can speak, but he can't do much else. But he leads a really rich, extraordinary life. You know, he's married. Uh, you know, he lives with Thomas. Is is because John's gay. He lives with Thomas. He's um, he runs a, a really good Duchenne charity. He used to work for the Green Party. He was a politician. <laughs> he's done a PhD. I mean, it's just extraordinary. So, and there's a whole but the complex thing around what what's difficult about Duchenne is that. When you try and apply disability rights to that, it gets more complex. Why? Because Duchenne is a d- degenerative progressive condition. Right. So even someone like John, who's a proud disabled person, says, I'm not, I'm not for one moment going to try and say that I'm a proud, I'm proud to have Duchenne, because you can't be proud to have Duchenne. Course, because it's, yeah. you know, and that's where it's different from other disabilities, if that makes sense. So some other disabilities, you know, there, are some, there are many activists now that don't even want to be referred to as disabled. In other words, they, they want to celebrate the disability. This is slightly different because, you know, because the, the nature of Duchenne, it's, we had to walk that line between, 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 uh, you know, I suppose it, it's a hard line to walk basically between, you know, championing, championing the, the kind of, you know, the humanity of somebody like John and how he battles his disease, but at the same time recognizing 
the seriousness of the disease, which has which has made his life very very difficult, which he himself acknowledges despite being a disabled activist. If that makes sense. No, it it, it does. Yeah. It's it's one of those things where, especially from a a broader almost pop cultural standpoint, the disabled tend to get put in a box and yeah. sort of you know categorized and put over there. But then we lose focus on the person or the people who have, you know, no matter the, the disability, no matter what it is. And I'm kind of curious from your perspective, how important is sort of the expression of art for us to be able to look past the disability and see the people? Because I mean, like I said, especially sort of out there in the media, we tend to see the disability and not the person, which I mean, I mean, I think that that's true in so many cases, we need to start seeing the people so much more. Yeah, I mean, look, I think it kind of extends to so many things in our world at the moment, doesn't it? extends to race, to religion, yeah. to, I think we, we all have that human quality to zone in on, to zone in on a point of difference. And I think what we try to do in this film is, you know, there is that, there is that sort of resounding message of celebration, difference and diversity, but, but trying to do that, try, I suppose, trying to do that in a meaningful way, because often the narrative at the moment can be, a little frustrating for all of us uh, so i think we were but but yeah i mean look i think i was i was that person like like probably many other abled bodied people who would you know who would certainly i might not admit it to myself but i, I had a tendency to stare at the disabled mm. and actually when you when, when when you when you when you have disabled kids or you have disabled friends or disabled loved ones and you, and you, and you live with disability then that really changes, you know, because you that it's only really then that you start to see beyond the disability, like you really see the person. But I think you need, I think you need some direct personal experience of it before you can do that, you know. For sure, is, yeah. and I'm kind of, I'm I'm curious, like when you're when you're doing something like this, because obviously it is a personal project. Is there a moment, sort of, in the process where you know you've got it, like where you know the film is working, or that you're doing something? sort of positive or the right way? Because I can imagine, especially when you're in the moment, not just filming, but maybe even in editing, putting everything together, you're not ever going to be 100% sure if it's working until maybe one specific moment. Was there a moment they sort of in it all where you knew it was going to work? I, I don't know if I was ever that confident, really. I, mean, I think that, look, I think that, um, but the hard thing in a way is, that, you know, you know this, is that when you're when you're filmmaking is that you have to, you're still selecting the truth, aren't you? I mean, the yeah. reality is no documentary is, is objective, even even you know even if you aspire aspire for it to be you know even something purely observational. There's all, you're you're still selecting what you put in that film, and so I think it was really about the, the thing that the thing that drove this whole thing was just trying to trying to capture for for people that it that it how hard but also how extraordinary it is to live with seriously disabled kids and what that means as a parent and everything else and, and if we could get somebody if we if, if, it, if, it, if it meant that this film can help other parents get through what we're going through or can help anybody else with a disability or anybody else without a disability relate to this you know to get a handle on this world then great uh, uh, you know that that's um that was kind of the broad the broad goal of it yeah i mean and that really does does feel like it comes through in the film because there is a real honesty to it and i mean you really do get the sense of wanting to just sort of share the experience and show the world that you know i can imagine there's a lot of people out there who feel like they're alone in this situation but the reality is there isn't and I think you've made a beautiful piece of art that kind of shows that. And I think that's really at the end of the day, the important thing as a, as a film and probably for you as a filmmaker, just to be able to have sort of that personal connection, even if it's just one family that goes, thank you for making the film that probably at the end of the day is the payoff for you. Yeah. I mean, it's, I think with all these things, it's just sharing is just um, sharing is just so important, you know, and, and actually if you can, I think what we wanted to do is to kind of share the, share the, the hard stuff as well as the good stuff. Cause you know, <laughs> It's so often the case, you know, that you can you can have very um, kind of over over edited portraits, you know. Right. So you know, I think we really wanted to look. It's about part of my language is about basically saying to people very honestly, it's fucking hard. <laughs> <laughs> it's fucking hard, but actually, you know what? There's there's a lot of light in there as well. You know, it's just you know, yeah, 
Yeah, well, and I mean, I think that's the magic of storytelling, and it's the magic of filmmaking. It's it's getting to know about people and seeing the yeah. light, the the dark moments with the light moments, which is kind of what makes the human experience. And thank you for making a beautiful film, and thank you for the time today, Nick. Yeah, thank you. And don't forget to to visit our friends over at Bay Street Video for all your DVD, Blu-ray rental, or purchasing needs this summer, as they are still open for curbside and some mailing delivery as well. Over at 1172 Bay Street, Toronto, Ontario, Canada, you can give them a call at 416-964-9088. That's 416-964-9088. Or send them an email at baystreetvideoto at gmail.com for any of your DVD and Blu-ray needs.